1380 KCIM Sports presents KCIM Sports Rewind. A look back at the week in high school sports. Brought to you by St. Anthony Rehab Services. Here's sports director Jeff Blankman, John Ryan, and Jeff Honnold. All right, kind of a wrap-up here on some of the fall sports seasons as everything came to a, a very quick and, and quicker than probably we expected end. Would you say, Jeff? Yeah, um, you know, for Kemper football, you were going to play number one, so you weren't the favorite there. Yeah, that you I know? mean, that, that one was a long road trip. You knew it was yep. going to be a very big uphill climb. Yep, and, and I tell you what, they played really, really well. People are going to look at the final score and not, you know, realize that was a 27-27 game. You know, early in the fourth quarter, they had they had some opportunities, and then Kemper volleyball. You know, you thought they had a shot to maybe win that that opening round, and then you never know what happens after that but you are the sixth seed playing the three seed. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I I guess not totally surprised, uh, you know, and stuff. So we still have girls swimming uh, state coming up this weekend. And what a uh, what a Saturday that they had. So, yeah, definitely. They had a great Saturday. And I think the biggest upset so far is that uh, Casey Miners beat you in here this morning. I mean, what the heck? Yeah, we're going to have to fix that next week. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you you did tell me you almost forgot it was Tuesday. So, Uh, yeah, it was a little after nine o'clock and I'm like, oh, God. Gosh, I better get down to the office. <laughs> yeah, I looked at Casey when we were out there. I was like, yeah, he'll walk in about uh, 9.29. <laughs> I said, he has been known to do that in the past. <laughs> so uh, we, Let's talk about David Ross here for a minute. Uh, Major League Baseball news broke last night. The Cubs, Jed Hoyer, the general manager, firing David Ross. And they're hiring the hottest name out there, Craig yep. Council, from the Milwaukee Brewers to come in and be the new Cubs manager. And not just the new Cubs manager, the highest paid manager in baseball at $8 million a year. Yeah, and, and I think anytime you're the hottest name out there, you're, you're going to get the big checks. But what that also tells me is that what he won five of six division titles with Milwaukee. Um, you wonder well what's thought go- of. That's yeah, for sure. absolutely, and, and 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 probably should be. It sounds to me like the Cubs are going to make a concerted effort to probably put teams out there that can win and win at a high level. And then you question Milwaukee. It's like okay. What are you doing letting him go? Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you got a guy that keeps winning the divisions for you. Um, Yeah, you haven't went deep. You haven't made the World Series. But what are you doing? Council, nine seasons in Milwaukee, took the Brewers to the postseason five times. Five of those were division titles. Yep. And if you think of Craig Council's teams, they are very good at pitching. Yep. And I really like that because the Cubs already have maybe not a top staff to work with, but their staff isn't bad by any right. means. No. So, I, uh, I think the Brewers have gotten rid of more talent over the years and still been just on the same mm-hmm. level. I mean, you get rid of a, a hater, the, your back-end closer. Right. I mean, that guy was just electric. He goes to the Padres, not as good a team, and He's not quite the 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 hater that that you know he, he would have saw in Milwaukee clubhouse issues uh, out yeah. in San Diego. That was the biggest thing. They were supposed to be really good this year, but uh, mm-hmm. you know their clubhouse sounds like it's yeah. just an absolute mess. But it sounds like the Cubs are getting ready to open up a checkbook. I yeah. mean, for once, I mean Cubs fans have been begging, yeah. begging, go out and get some of these guys. I mean you're a major market team, go do this, and they haven't been here and there. They've signed a couple of guys, but nothing, nothing. I don't think that like that we're going to see this offseason. You know the the thing I'm going to say to that though is that Dodger fans going out and buying teams and trying to buy championships don't always work because the Dodgers have what what they won one and that was in the mm-hmm. the, the uh, COVID, COVID stro- you know shortened season they win divisions but they you know they haven't been able to win titles Yankees it's been a long time since they've won a title Mets have tried to buy a title haven't been able to do it if you look at the teams that were there this year it's teams that have kind of built with it in smart you know built teams that are good teams so going out and spending a lot of money doesn't always guarantee. I agree with you. I think the Cubs mm-hmm. are looking to do that, but I don't think that guarantees anything in today's sports world. And the Cubs have one of the best farm systems in yes. Major League Baseball right now. Uh, yeah, a few years ago, they were terrible, yeah. but yes. they've really built credit, it up. Credit Joy, Jed Hoyer and the, in the front office for drafting people and because and I, I really think that they have a couple guys in their farm system that as soon as they get ready could be difference makers right. for the Major League team. Uh, and, I, and I think going out and spending, I could see them. I think Bellinger is going to be they extended him a qualifying offer yesterday right. that's probably the one guy you're really looking at him trying to go out and get because the Cubs had three guys that won gold gloves you had you had right. Cody Bellinger yeah. and they and, and they have a really good defense and I think that if you compare councils the way that 
Council's coach teams that can pitch really well and the Cubs defense already being really well, I think that that's going to be kind of the recipe for success next year uh, because I, I it's going to be tough to sign a Bellinger and then potentially go out and get a Shohei. Right. You know, because Shohei's been linked with the Cubs ever since that he said that he wasn't going to go back to L.A. So. Is, right. is that the name that, that you think that the Cubs are going to go after? Because it makes sense. I mean, yeah. he's not going to be able to pitch next year with right. the arm issues, but he will be able to play and bat, so that's yep. kind of different and unusual. Yep. I, I, I think that he, when he first came over, the Cubs were one of his final teams that he wanted to go to. He's really good friends with Seiya Suzuki, who plays for the Cubs right now, right. and 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 then that's kind of what all the talks have been. Uh, I don't I don't know if it happens because I think that his play style fits more staying out on the West Coast because uh, because he's a really good hitter. When you play in Chicago, as you see the Cubs at the beginning of the year, their <laughs> yeah. hitting numbers aren't the best because it's cold. But yeah, I, I don't know. Boy, you put a guy like that on even last year's Cubs team. Yes, that what a huge difference oh, that yeah. would make. My Absolutely. goodness. Absolutely. Do you I mean, think they can get Bellinger back? Because from what everything I understand is, is that none of those guys that got the offers yesterday, they're all going to test the market. Yeah. So Bella, Bellinger, becomes, no way he takes yeah. a qualifying offer. No, yeah. Yeah. he's going to sign yeah. a longer term I, deal. I, I, yeah. I agree. I, th- I think that I think that he tests the market, but right. from all the talks, though, it sounds like he loved playing in Chicago. Okay. Kind of re, re, revamped, him. Yeah. revamped yeah. his career a little bit. So I I wouldn't be surprised that if the, he kind of feels the market and the Cubs kind of see where his other offers are at and they kind of offer him based off of that. Yeah, his agent will not let him take that qualifying no. offer. No. <laughs> he's going to like, no, we're, we're going to yeah. go. You may want to sign with Chicago, and we will maybe eventually, but we're going to go get some other offers right. and test all that. Now, you said teams aren't buying championships. Rangers did. I mean, they, w- they went out and spent a ton of money on guys that True. didn't play, actually. True. Uh, with uh, with DeGrom and right. some of those guys, and even Scherzer at the end. Yeah. Uh, they didn't pitch much for him, but, boy, they added some big-time points. Corey they did. Seager. And right. Those. Yeah. The only thing I will say there, though, is, is I'm a Bruce Bochy guy. I think they won that World Series because of Bruce Bochy. <laughs> yeah. Not that the players didn't do it, but Bruce Bochy wins everywhere he goes, and, and you know, I, I think he got rejuvenated by taking a little time off and came back hungry I, I think they won that as much with you know Bruce Bochy as they did with the players I think I, it's easier to build a team off of really good pitching than it is position players um, just because Cardinals I think, have done it for years yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes just because you look at a team like the Mets or the Yankees you know Hitters, you don't really know how their season's going to go. You, you could go one season batting 300, and the next season you could bat 240. Right. I think pitchers, you kind of look at their numbers, and the roughly they kind of stay right around the same from year to year to year to year. When you have a better year, you might have a down year the next year, but they're still roughly right around the same numbers. Yeah. Uh, so I think that kind of helped Texas in a way a little bit this yep. year because a lot of their position players, besides a Corey Seager and a Marcus Simeon, those have guys that they've either acquired via trade. Like an Adolis Garcia was, you know, a no name prospect from St. Louis that they traded right. for, mm-hmm. and now he's yeah. a superstar, you know. Yeah. So. Yep. So, speaking of Texas, that leads me to my trivia question for this week. <laughs> All right. I like these different ones here. So, uh, talking city Grand Slams. You know, a Grand Slam in tennis is winning right. all four majors. Well, yep. in a city Grand Slam, you got to win a major championship. Uh, football, baseball, hockey, and basketball. Okay. So, obviously, clearly, New York, Boston, Chicago, L.A., they've all done it. There's four other cities out there that have city Grand Slams. They've won championships in all four of the major sports. Okay. So that's our trivia question. What are those other four cities that join New York, Boston, L.A., and Chicago? Okay. So that's the question of the morning. So, by the way, uh, I'm going to give props out to my Vikings. Yeah. Holy cow. What? What? Uh, Joshua bring, Dobbs. The guy wasn't even in the building until Wednesday. Just still doesn't know the name of his teammates. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know the name of his teammates when he went into play. And I thought, you know, once Jaron Hall went down, I'm like, oh, forget this. Because I watched on tape delay. Right. And I'm like, I'm not going to spend three hours watching this stupid game that the Vikings are going to get blown out. So I looked it up, and I'm like, okay, they're close at the end. Pulled it up about 10 minutes there. I'm like, man, they actually pulled that one out. Right. With Kevin O'Connell basically describing the plays in the 15 seconds he had to, uh, to um, Dobbs. And saying, okay, you know, here's the play. Here's what's going to happen. Right. And then hoping it happened. <laughs> and Dobbs went out and, and did enough to make it work. He did. That's one of the craziest performances I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Question will be is, is does it continue? Yeah. You know, you know, will he play as well week two or week three, you know, and stuff. So, But it's a great story. Absolutely yeah. great story. Yeah. The best part of it is that if you were uh, watching the game, there was a clip that went viral after the game of him 
right before he's getting ready to go in, he's got the starting offensive line there. He's sitting there telling him about yeah. his cadences. And he's having the center <laughs> snap him the ball, and yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. there was one where uh, the the right tackle Brian O'Neill said, "Man, I've never even uh, you know taken a snap with this guy." In which the center turned around and goes, "Oh, really? You <laughs> have taken a snap with him?" <laughs> so crazy stuff going on there. Iowa, Iowa State, uh, boy, that that game at uh, at uh, Wrigley Field again. I, I, Deacon Deacon Hill made a comment the other day that said that uh, well you know it's starting to click you know on the, our offense is getting better and I'm like Didn't I don't know like if it. I saw it dude I don't know if I did <laughs> Didn't look like it I, I won't comment <laughs> I, I saw something and said that that was the seventh highest scoring game at Wrigley Field played within the last year That's kind of sad <laughs> <laughs> that, now, now that's a stat for you right yeah. there <laughs> That is funny So and then Iowa State and Kansas over the over that Saturday night uh, the the kick return again a controversy on a kick return involving an Iowa team Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know I when you watch it fast play, it looks like like you could see where the ref kind of you know maybe thought he stepped out because I think there was one point where his, his leg yeah. crossed over his other leg and kind of looked like he stepped out. But when you slow it down, it's not even close. And they right. should they should have seen that on replay, yeah. you know, that it wasn't even close. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm surprised that they didn't catch it was on replay because you know I I think that we forget sometimes the speed of the game and how quickly things are happening for the officials yeah. out there. So they're going to get things wrong, and it seems like in the last decade that they've gotten a lot more things wrong than what they were 10 years ago or more and I think the speed of the game is there I, I, I think that when it was the official that was in front of the play but I think there was a defender that went sliding out of bounds as he just missed the tackle and I think he might have gotten confused on whose mm-hmm. body it was that you know was, yeah. was going out of bounds but at that you part. let but the play go mm-hmm. you let it go and then you review it I, I'm not arguing with you the only fun thing I laugh about is is that every Iowa fan was screaming on the punt return, yeah. blow the whistle, blow the whistle. If you're going to call the flag, blow the whistle, blow the play dead. And now everybody's screaming the other way. Let the play play out. Let the play play out. It's like the officials yeah. can't win but I think no matter two, what they do. I think do. it's two different scenarios. Like it they're, is, they're, but it's, it's yeah. the same thing. It's yeah. whether or not you let a play no. play out or not. Mm-hmm. The one constant is if your offense plays better in those games, whether you're talking <laughs> Iowa, Minnesota, yeah. or Kansas, Iowa State, yeah. you don't have this problem. You're not talking about it yeah. the next week. Just yeah. play better. As, uh, Denny McCartan was like, we said, you know, great halftime adjustments. You know, what did you do? And he goes, nothing. We just told him to play better. <laughs> <laughs> and that will come to Jesus at halftime. That's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. Follow the game plan. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, all right. So that, that kind of covers up some of the some of the uh, nationwide and then some of the local uh, statewide sports news. So let's talk about state swimming. This is, uh, once again, a, a great performance by the Carroll's every swim team. Yeah, uh, Deb Dander is, is, does such a good job of getting the girls ready for the state qualifying meet, and, and this year was no exception. I, I know when I talked to her on Friday morning that uh, she was really excited about where the girls were at. She said that they were really super pumped and, and felt really good. They had a great week of practice. Um, and then they went over to, to Ames on, on Saturday and, and absolutely tore things up. Finished in third uh, as a team. Uh, uh, against two highly, really, really highly ranked teams in Ames and, and Sioux City Metro. But uh, you qualify seven different events. You get all three of your relays. You get four individual events in um, and stuff. And in one of those individual events, you're sending two different swimmers. So you actually send, you know, technically you could say eight events uh, down to the state swim meet. Uh, the other cool thing about it was is that every race and every swimmer, no matter if they qualified or not, had a personal best at that meet. So everybody went out and swam their best race of the season at that meet. Crazy thing I want to add, too, is that Ames is a new pool. So yes. none of them have swam there before. And to yep. come out and get PRs and everything is is, is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, uh, you know, so you set two school records. Um, the uh, 200 medley relay team of uh, Maya Vellingerhoof, uh, Emma Myers, Amelia Holt, and Zelda DeMoss uh, broke the record that was set in 2010. And then Emma Myers broke her own record. And I want to make sure I get the correct event because she's in four of them. Uh, it's the 100 breaststroke. So she uh, set her and broke her own school record in that. And she's actually going into that event ranked number one in the state. Um, so got a chance to bring home a, a state championship coming up this weekend. If, so that's really cool. And if I'm not correct, she already qualified for that before last she night had, too. So yes, yep. So yeah, for Saturday. Yeah, really excited about being able to go. Casey and I are both going over there on Saturday. We'll get some video interviews um, with the girls and and uh, yeah, this is. <laughs> 
They've sent quite a few kids over yeah. before, but I, I, I just think there, there's was, a different mm-hmm. excitement level with this group this yeah. year. Was this expected at the beginning of the year that they were no. going to get this many qualified? I didn't think no. so. No, I, I think if you'd have said halfway through the season, you know, they were sitting here going, okay, you know, Emma is in, but nobody else has already pre qualified. So we've got, you know, a couple of our relays that should get in, one that might get in. We've got some other kids in individual events that are close. Mm-hmm but aren't there yet and then they go over there and just like you know Saturday was just a, a really really good day for them the day, the day, the, I think it really clicked yes uh, yes now the go ahead when I, when I was over for senior night in Denison I think they had a good night they I think they won almost every they won all oh, they did win every single event right but I I, I think that talking to the kids uh, they might have been really looking forward to going to Ames uh, because it was a new pool somewhere they yep. never swam before so I think that kind of played in to how, how you prepare and how you get ready for uh, that qualifying me and it, and it showed to pay off pretty well. Yeah, the, the one thing that I will say that's going to be interesting is is that they have prelims on Friday this week and then the finals are on Saturday. Um, when I had my conversation Saturday morning with Deb um, you know on the, on the Pizza Ranch Coaches Show, she did talk about the fact that you know in swimming you taper towards the end of the season so that, you know, and they time it. You know, different schools do it differently. Carroll High times to have their girls ready for state qualifying. In other words, they're tapering they're off the tapering training. tapering the training so that they're at their strongest, you know, at, at the qualifying meet time. And this year they timed it perfectly, I think. Then they got to try to maintain that taper for a week mm-hmm. and, and, and hope that it'll pull through. A lot of your elite programs don't taper for the state qualifying because they already know they're going to get a bunch of events. They've tapered for the state finals, so they've tapered Mm -hmm. for this upcoming weekend. So that'll be that's going to be an interesting story for me to see if Carol and how well they take the taper that was set for this past Saturday and kind of keep it and and can you know continue to be on that taper and as strong as what they were. That's so. interesting because you know you'd normally think a week wouldn't make that big of a difference. Right. Yeah, you wouldn't think. I mean I wonder what Deb Danner says about, you know, yeah. is a week a long time for you guys if you're not I suppose you don't have any meets and you right. nothing in between. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and that's I I'm I i do not know enough about swimming, but she was the one that brought up that they taper to be at their best and at their peak for the, the, the state qualifying and then try to maintain that for the week. And she says a lot of your elite programs um, taper to be at their best to come next, this coming Saturday. So, it, yeah, it's it. we'll see which one plays out and, and how it plays out. So. Okay. Yeah, kind of like cross country. I would think yeah. almost like that training for that because you yeah. know in between qualifying and state, I mean, you're not going to go out and log a ton of miles. Right. Yeah, not real hard miles. I wouldn't think. And it's, I wonder. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if she has to tell the girls, no, you're not going to do this. <laughs> just, I only want you to do this. Yeah, I, I think the girls and the coaches to do that. Yeah, I think the girls enjoyed the taper though because uh, prior <laughs> to the taper is what they call Hell Week, where you know they're she's breaking them down, you know, and, and stuff by their log a ton of you know yards and miles mm-hmm. and, and everything every day so I'm, well, I, honestly I've been tapering for the last 20 years so you know just to be my best at this moment so you know <laughs> <laughs> I've been tapering for 53 <laughs> we got KCIM Sports Rewind we're going to talk about state uh, volleyball and of course the football playoffs and the KCIM Rewind event and plus your trivia answer all coming up KCIM Sports Rewind is brought to you by St. Anthony Rehab Services as the athletes at your house prepare for hard work and fun of the season, remember that St. Anthony Rehab Services provides physical therapy for any sports injury that may sideline your member of the team. Sports injuries can plague kids of all ages and keep them from playing the sport they love. Athletes will be under the direct supervision of a certified and licensed healthcare professional in the newly renovated sports performance facility. If an injury is keeping your athlete out of the game, call St. Anthony Rehabilitation Services at 794-5000 for sports injury and treatment rehab. It is KCIM Sports Rewinds. Uh, Assistant Sports Director Casey Miner, Sports Director Jeff Blankman. You know, and me. I'm hanging out here. <laughs> I got nothing better to do for the half an hour. 
You except, enjoy it. Except listen to you guys talk yeah. about sports. So Yeah? Uh, what do you want to start? You want to start with volleyball or you want to start with football? Wherever you lead us, we'll follow. Ah, that is a scary, <laughs> scary scenario. Let's talk football. That was last Friday night. Yep. Uh, once again, Kemper making that long road trip basically to the outskirts of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah. The, 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 two cool things about it. One, you know, it's the first time they had made the, the quarterfinals since they, you know, won the state championship. So that, that was really cool. Two, got a chance to run into Terry Kaspar. Only got to talk to him oh, yeah. for about 30 seconds or so. Yeah, we had lunch uh, with Terry just before yeah. he left, before he moved away. Yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, Terry, one of the really, truly great guys and stuff. So it was kind of fun. Uh, he made the track. Yeah, he. I think he was 20 minutes or a half an hour or something like that, he said, yeah. fr- from his house. So, yeah, I did ask the guys up there in the booth when I got there. I'm like, okay, so how far to the border? And they're like, yeah, six. Yeah. Six miles to the border. And then we're only like eight or nine or something like that from the South Dakota border. So you're, you're, you're up there in the in the corner about as far as you can yep. get. I think the only other time that I've maybe been farther, you know, or, or closer to both of the borders probably is when I went to West Lyon with ICAM Manning a few years ago. I hmm. think I, if I remember correctly, I think that one might be tucked like literally oh, like no. right in the corner. It's like literally yeah. Clorinda is only like you throw a rock and you can throw it into Missouri yeah. practically. Yeah, so. I remember the time you and I went down there years ago and we turned the wrong direction coming out of Clorinda <laughs> and we went, oh, that says almost yeah. we're almost welcome to the Missouri. <laughs> it's like turned a, turned a two plus hour trip into about a three plus hour trip yeah. I think, on that night. So you should never let me drive. Never. I don't think I did after that. <laughs> but let's talk about the actual game. How did it yeah. go for Kemper? You know, people, I, I said this to you guys before we went on. People that only look at final scores and try to judge games are not going to realize that that was a really good football game. It was a really tight football game. It slipped away from Kemper over the final 10 minutes of the game. Um, really, maybe over about the, the final eight or so minutes, uh, seven and a half, eight minutes of that game. But, uh, you know, they, they led it at halftime 21 15, scored on three of their first four possessions of the, of the first half. Um, their passing game. Uh, Central Lion did not have an answer for it in the first half. Um, the defense struggled some, as we thought they might, but but came up with uh, you know some plays to be able to to get a stop or two. Um, did give up over 200 yards to two different runners uh, in the game, the quarterback and the running back. Um, Central Line threw a total of four passes in the game. Two of them were Hail Marys at the end of the first half. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they didn't feel they needed to throw the ball and, and didn't have to. But, you know, Kemper Talk had... Talk about a quick game. Yes, yes. Kemper had a nice mix to open the game of running and throwing. They weren't gaining much in the run game, but it was keeping Central Lions defense, I thought, a little bit honest, uh, you know, because they they might run it two or three times in a row and then pick up the first down on, on a pass. So it wasn't that you could just come out. And, and I think the other thing, we've talked about it all year, Kemper has so many athletes mm-hmm. that they can throw at you. Okay, what are you going to do? You're going to try to take away Ben Gherkin, or you're going to try to take away Michael Kaspabar, or you're going to try to take away DJ Vanami, but that's going to leave so many of these other guys available and, yeah. and stuff to be able to hurt you and Jake Houseman and Carson Candy. And I know I was talking with Tim Raya, one of the assistant coaches and the receivers coach for them and he's like you know we haven't had to use Kenny a lot here lately so we're going to kind of break him out a little bit more tonight and, and he had a really good game but uh, you know they played well um, there was two really key moments to me um, one right there towards the end of the first half I think Kemper caught a break I'd have to go back and, and be able to see the you know the huddle video for sure but um, they kicked one off they were supposed to be a squib uh, coach Steinkamp kind of laughed about it because I said you know calling an onside kick right there before the end of the first half and it worked for you and he we didn't call it onside <laughs> he, he said we were supposed to squib it and uh, they kind of miskicked it a little bit it looked to me up in the booth it for one it never went 10 yards it looked to me like it hit the back of one of the Kemper guys and then bounced backwards and Kemper jumped on it. Well, if that was the case, it should have been dead, it right, dead. Where it, yep, right where it touched the Kemper kid originally. The officials did give the ball to Kemper um, with uh, you know two minutes or so left, three minutes left in the half. They got within field goal range and and, and weren't able to, to get the field goal. That would have put them up 24 to 15 at the halftime. I think if they could have scored, whether it be a field goal or a touchdown there, that would have been huge going mm-hmm. into the half. But they didn't score 
and then in the in the early in the fourth quarter after they had traded some punts and then some touchdowns uh, in the third both defenses made stops right out of the half and then both offenses scored again you're tied at 27 Central Lion gets the ball they march right down the field as they really had done most of the game scored they kick off they're trying to pooch one down the sideline to keep away from Carson Canny who's got a couple of returns for touchdowns this year between uh, punts and kickoffs and Kemper doesn't fall on the football Central Lion does at the Kemper 16 yard line Um, all of a sudden you go from a one possession game where you should have the football and you've been able mm-hmm. to move the ball and score it. All of a sudden, they punch it in two plays later, and they're up 14 with like five minutes left in the game. And it just felt mm-hmm. like all the momentum swung at, at that point. Kemper got the ball back, wasn't able to score. Central Line punched another one in with a few minutes left in the game. And you go from, a, like I said, a 27 27 game with 10 36, I think, or something like that left in the ball game to all of a sudden it's a 48 to 27 final. So game much closer than what that final score indicated. And one thing I got to say, the props to the Kemper offense. Yes. That was the highest points that's ever been that's been put up on Central Lion this year and it's by double digits too. I yeah. mean, they gave up 14 was their highest so far this year and yep. Kemper put up 27. Yep. And so. and as I was packing up the bag um, and stuff there at the end of the night in the press box, I I wish the Central Lion folks that were in there, they were really good to us. They wished them the best of luck up in the dome and and they're like, "Wow, this is this was the scariest game." I I know we only beat West Lion 7 to nothing earlier this year, but that was in a torrential downpour and they just couldn't get their offense established that night. Uh, but they said that that Kemper actually played them better than anybody else had all season long. And I, I told some of the Kemper kids that, you know, on, on Saturday at our Rewind All-Star festivities, you know, uh, it probably doesn't help, the, you know, the feelings at this point. But I think someday as they get older, when they look back, mm-hmm. especially if Central mm-hmm. Lion wins a state championship, they'll be able to look back and go, you know, we, we probably gave them a better game than maybe anybody all season. Mm-hmm. I bet they were pretty sore for that rewind event (laughs) (laughs) night after that game. Uh, We got a quick talk about Kemper Volleyball, of course, uh, against the opening round Grundy Center. Boy, that two-way class was just loaded. It it was. uh, The only thing that caught me off guard throughout the whole tournament, I thought Kemper could win against Grundy Center, but I knew Grundy Center would be really good uh, being the three seed, was that I thought the Hinton-Dyke-New-Hartford championship match would be at least competitive. (laughs) (laughs) Dyke Dyke made, made everybody in the tournament it looked like they're not on the same level. Wow. Yeah, they, they absolutely flattened them. I think they gave up double digits in scoring and only two sets or three sets the entire tournament. They gave up one in the first set against in their opening round and then in the second round I think the, the team only scored in double digits once that was Denver and then I think Hinton got in double digits twice they didn't get it because yeah, okay. the first set was like 25 though, the second set was like 25 21 then I think the last one was like 25 14 yeah so if I remember but, correctly yeah, so but just absolutely controlled them so but I remember you said that uh, you know you don't you do not want to be seed seven or eight because you know, one and two a Hinton and Dyke yep. you didn't want to run into them until possibly and, and, the final or at least you know and Hinton manhandled Grundy Center no, in, did, the way, yeah. in, in the semifinal so they were dominant up to that point and I had said before the tournament I I wouldn't have wanted to play Dyke this year yet the Peterson girls they should have won the state championship last year they they let it kind of slip away and set five mm-hmm. they should have been playing for their fourth straight state championship and then they'll play for their fourth straight state championship in basketball coming up potentially this winter because they've won three in a row I thought Dyke was going to come in mad and looking for a little you know revenge from last year and I think they wish they could have ran into Western Christian who won the 3A championship this year (laughs) uh, but they were in a different class but uh, back to Kemper real quick played really well Um, came out you could tell the nerves in the first Mm -hmm. set were there and and that, that affected them some but I thought about the middle part of, of set one, they started playing a little bit more like Kemper and settled in, and I thought played much better after that. Um, I thought they did a good job. The Willis girl ended up with 28 kills, but I thought they did a nice job getting some touches on her, getting some blocks on her, kind of forcing her to do some other things. Um, they just, you know, it was just one of those that I, I think Grundy Center was slightly better, um, and, and that was the difference in it. I think when Elsa Tiefenthaler came in and served for her first time in that first set, kind of really sparked. She always brings the yeah, energy. Yeah. Kind, kind of really sparked the Knights a little bit. And, and the Willis girl, you knew coming in that she was going to 
see the ball a lot. Yep. And I think Kemper did a really good job in the middle with Witchrock and Glenn yep. to you know set up those blocks and kind of force her to go different ways. And even though she, you're going to look at the stats, she finished 28 kills, but it was a hard fought, hard fought <laughs> 28. Yeah. yeah. Grundy Center had their lowest kill efficiency, I think, up to that point in the season against mm-hmm. uh, against Kemper that day. So I, I thought Kemper played really well. I know I had a lot of people kind of ask me, did Kemper just not play well? And it's like, no. I mean, you got to remember, Kemper was the six seed. Grundy Center was the three seed, so yeah. they weren't the favorites, you know, going, going in. into you're, that. You're not yeah. playing a slack team anywhere yeah. in Class 2A. Yeah, absolutely. You know, five teams out of that one conference, no, they weren't going to come, yeah, they mm-hmm. weren't going to come in, you know, intimidated uh, against what was, you know, and, and tip your cap. I thought, like I said, I thought Kemper played well. Could they have done better? Absolutely, but Grundy Center probably could point at some things that they could have done better, you know, in, in the match as well. And Casey Peter, I, I think, summed it up. She said, you know, sometimes you just lose to a better team, and today they were the better team. All right, next year, Kemper losing some great seniors off yes. this year's team. Reload or rebuild? What Re- is it? Reload. Reload. <laughs> yeah. No um, hesitation for either one of you there. Yeah, no. It, uh, Casey and I have felt it all year. Jeff Hondold said it, you know, at the end of the broadcast. You know, we're really excited about Brianna Wittrock. Uh, just a sophomore. She's got two years left. You bring back pretty much everything in the back row uh, with Kaylee Simons and Brooke Roy and the talent that they have back there. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have Brianna. Wittrock, you're going to have Elsa Tiefenthaler, Carson, Carson Overmull. Um, they have got, and, and they'll find other hitters. You know, the, Sh- you know Olivia, Olivia Schenkelberg. Yeah, they, they're going to have other players that are going to be able to step into those roles. Not that the, the senior group isn't going to be very missed because it was a special group, but they always seem to have some younger kids that are ready to jump into the mix. All right, Rewind event happened on the Saturday. Tell us about that. How'd it go? That went really well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of kids showed up. I think a lot of kids had fun with uh, the, the volleyball, especially the football players. I think had a lot of fun with the volleyball game. And then yep. the girls, I think, had fun, you know, throwing the – with the passing competition and then all the pictures that Jeff took. You know, you could just see the smiles in the kids' faces. And I had a laugh because Brock Bating didn't want to sign up for the passing competition <laughs> right away, even though he was our offensive player of the year and ended up winning the passing yeah. competition for the boys. <laughs> you, you know who signed him up? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm like our offensive player. Player of the year is not, and a quarterback is not yeah. going to be in our. I say he was, he smiled when I did it, but uh, yeah, that was the thing. You know, some people might go, oh, you know, there wasn't a ton of kids there at the time that we did the award ceremony. I, I always try to remember it's like the Iowa State game was going on. We had a ton of kids that messaged me like, hey, I'm going out to Chicago to the, you know, the Iowa game. Mm-hmm. You know, we had kids that came and played in the All Star game and then did some of the other things, but then left to be able to get to the Iowa State game because they had tickets for it. So when you hold, you know, the All Star event on a yeah. Saturday day in the football season, you're, you're going to have some kids. So I appreciate everybody that came out, even if they came out mm-hmm. for just a little yeah. while. But, you know, like Casey said, the fun thing for me is being able to walk around. I went and sat in every group with every team that was there at some point during the day and just chit-chatted with them. And they were all laughing and smiling and having fun. Uh, I thought one of the really funny things was the look on the volleyball girl's face faces when the football boys were trying to play volleyball. <laughs> the, the lack of skill that the football boys have in playing volleyball because the I'm, girls were I'm like, going to tell you this. I thought Edward Miller made, he, it look like, made it look easy out there. He did. But I will say this. I was sitting next to a group of, of the girls at one point and it was from three different teams all kind of in the same spot. So I kind of sat you know, in the middle and, and they were all one be set behind me and one on each side and they were like Everything's illegal. Every hit they make is illegal. <laughs> every pass they make, every dig they make, there's nothing legal out there, you know. And You're so, gonna yes. go tell them it's illegal? Yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah, I did say to the girls at one point, I'm like, okay, the next time you hear people say that playing volleyball is easy, especially the football boys, you should have a little video of this and go, yeah, see, see how easy this is. <laughs> yeah, to give, to give the football guys a little appreciation, you should have a girl out, a girls team out there, hitting, yes. hitting at them on that one, and see how, yes, how I think well. Get scared. I think they, I think they duck out of the way. <laughs> no doubt. So we're closing the book on the fall sports season. Open it up on the winter sports season. Got the bad girls basketball playoff preview show. That's going to be coming up this Saturday. In yep. fact, uh, you guys need to get on this. I was talking to Casey this morning. He said something about. So you got all your interviews done? He goes, Nope, not even close. <laughs> I've got two of mine. Got another one coming up here this morning, and then two more tomorrow. So I should be. If everybody answers the phone, yeah, I'll be done on Wednesday. So. Yeah, I've got two tomorrow. One. 
one on one on one on Thursday. And I'm still waiting to hear back from my coach. Yeah, yet, so. I got to start reading out, reaching out to my boys' coach. He says their preview show is the following Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you coaches, you don't want to you don't want to receive text messages from Casey and Jeff all night long, right? Yes, yes. Answer your text. And then for wrestling fans, we haven't forgot about you. We are going to get interviews with all the wrestling coaches. Those are going to go directly to the website. So be checking out our website here over the next couple of weeks. We'll start reaching out to the wrestling mm-hmm. coaches and stuff and and uh, getting those interviews done as well. All right, that wraps up KCM Sports Rewind. Next Tuesday morning, 930, we'll be right back here on KCIM.